What gets your attention, I wonder? Um, a post on a social network site for local uh, communities caught my attention um, recently. It was titled Psychic Recommendation. And uh, the woman who posted it said that she fancied just getting her cards read. And did anybody know of anyone who um, they would recommend to her? And um, I thought for a bit, and then I decided to send a private message to the woman. And I sent her this message. And I basically just said, um, I'm a Christian, I believe that God speaks, and um, this belief has changed my life for the good, and I know people who um, have consistently been able to hear God speak for other people, and um, I would be more than happy to introduce her to them if she would like. And I also told her about Alpha, and um, I also told her about you know the church that I go to and the service. So. Caroline S., if you're the here, I'm Emily L., it'd um, be great to meet you. But um, what also interested me and caught my attention was the fact that there were loads of other people on that thread who were also saying, oh, yeah, brilliant, Does anybody, I'd love to know, I'd love to know, I'd love to get my cards read, and da 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 And I just thought, you know what, rather than private messaging them all, I joined the thread, and I basically said the same thing that I had put in my message to Caroline. And uh, again, I put a link to Alpha and said, you know, if you want to come, either contact me or, you know, feel free to turn up. Um, I'd be so happy to meet you there. So I was thinking, gosh, these people, they're... They're searching for meaning, they're searching for um, guidance, they're searching for truth. And, um, and so I left, this, I left this message, and um, then that, that later, that morning that I'd put that up, I saw that there was an email from this social network site in my inbox. And initially I thought, you know when you kind of think, oh gosh, I feel a bit excited, but a bit nervous at the same time, thinking, what, what's it going to say? And the message basically said, your comment has been removed because it's deemed as irrelevant to the conversation. I, just, I was a bit put out by that, to be honest. And I just thought, nobody, nobody likes to be told that what they've just said is irrelevant. And, firstly, and then secondly, to read it in black and white just felt a bit brutal. But also I thought, gosh, these people are looking for meaning, for answers, for guidance. You know, Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is so relevant to the conversation. I thought, you know, you've totally misunderstood. I wanted to point them towards, you know, not just a building and not just a cause, but towards a person, towards Jesus. And the people in this passage that Cale read for us, they were also searching, looking for answers, looking for hope. And they came across Jesus, and he invited them. And if you've got your Bibles, keep them open, or if you're looking at it on your, on your phone, you know, verse 39 says, Come. Come, Jesus invites you to come. And from this passage, you know, the first thing you think, Jesus invites you to come as you are. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read passages in the Bible, I can have a bit of a temptation, a bit of a lean to put it into almost like a fictional category. And I think these are characters rather than real people. So I wanted to spend some time looking at who these different people are. Who was it that was coming to Jesus? There are six very different people in these verses. And the first one is John the Baptist. Now, John, he was a relative of Jesus. He was similar age, probably about six months older than him. Uh, John was from a priestly family, and he was born to elderly parents. He lived in the wilderness in Judea. Um, he had an unusual dress sense. I think it's interesting that the gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, note John the Baptist is sporting a waistcoat made of camel's hair and has chosen to accessorize with a leather belt around the waist. I, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I don't know whether that says more about John the Baptist or more about Mark and Matthew, the fact that they actually want to note that in. They're a bit like, just so you know what attire he's wearing, this is what it was. John ate locusts and honey. He wasn't one for socializing. He wasn't much of a party goer. In Matthew 11, it says, um, Jesus says of John, he came neither eating nor drinking. He, he was a bit of a recluse, actually, he didn't seek out the multitudes, and yet somehow they were attracted to him. John was the sort of person that was obedient to God. He was faithful, and he was focused. And then, so that's the first disciple. Second one in this list, Andrew. Now, Andrew means manly. Now, I reckon he was probably a man's man. 
He was a fisherman, outdoorsy type. If you know Marcus Hart, I reckon he's that kind of character. Someone who wears shorts all through the year. Um, you know, he was physically strong. And uh, <laughs> I can hear a come on, amen. It's Marcus is obviously in the room, isn't he? <laughs> and, uh, and, and actually, oh, this is not you, Marcus, but you know, we don't actually read, lo- well, this is Marcus, we don't actually read loads about Andrew in the Bible. He's not actually mentioned that many times, probably about a dozen times just 12 times in the whole of the New Testament. And many of those, actually, they're in like the list of the disciples. So he's only mentioned when everybody else is mentioned anyway. And he's referred to only in four main occurrences throughout the four Gospels. He's a pretty, pretty ordinary guy. That's where the distinction with Marcus ends. He's a pretty ordinary guy. In fact, he's probably most famous for being Simon Peter's brother. So that's John, that's Andrew, second one, Simon Peter in this passage here. Who is he? He's passionate. He's fiercely loyal. He's got a big heart. He's a type A personality. He's probably the person that gets all the girls. You know, in the four lists of the disciples, Peter is listed first every time. He wins big, he loses big. He doesn't do anything by halves. You know, Peter was the guy who spoke before he thought. Who was the one that steps out of the boat walking towards Jesus? It's Peter. You know, who's the one that draws the sword and cuts off the soldier's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane? Who's the one that made a massive profession of faith and then denied Jesus in a big way? Who's the guy that preaches a sermon and 3,000 people give their lives to Jesus in one day? You know, when Jesus says to the disciples, you know, I want to wash your feet, he's the guy that says, not just my feet, the whole of me, my head as well. I don't know if any of you have seen Peter Kay. Um, I love Peter Kay. I find him really funny. He does this little sketch about biscuits. Now, if Simon Peter was a biscuit, he'd be a hobnob. Dip me again. He's like, I'm all in. I'm all or nothing kind of a guy. But the thing is, you know, Andrew, he would have been in the shadows. Peter was in the spotlight. But without Andrew there would have been no Simon Peter. It's a bit like Albert McMakin. He was a 24-year-old farmer who became a Christian the year before. And uh, where he was living in the States, there was a preacher who was coming to town, and they did a series of tent meetings um, throughout the week. And Albert went round telling people, his family, his friends, his neighbours, to come to this tent meeting. And he asked a friend, Billy, if he would come. Billy said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to come. And uh, Albert had this idea, and he thought, um, I tell you what, if I ask Billy to get a truck, then he could drive the truck to take everybody to this tent meeting. And Billy didn't own a truck, so he was a bit like, opportunity to drive a truck, I'm all in, you know, whatever it takes, do you know what I mean, we're all different. Anyway, so the truck was the thing for him, he's like, great, I'd love to drive the truck. So he brought the truck, and he sat outside, he didn't listen to any... Um, He didn't go into any of the meetings, but he could hear what was going on. One night, he went into the tent. He walked up to the front, having heard the message of Jesus, and he gave his life to Jesus. That Billy was the well-known evangelist, Billy Graham, who went on to lead millions of people to Christ. Albert McMakin's enthusiasm and willingness to invite others to know Jesus led one man to Christ whose life and witness has impacted the entire globe. Fourthly, Philip. Now, he might not be the first name we think of when we think of the disciples, because he's actually not mentioned that much. Um, We know that it says in the verses here that he's from Bethsaida, the same town as Andrew and Peter. And perhaps we can piece together that he was probably a practical, pragmatic kind of guy, organized, systematic, efficient. Um, When we read about the feeding of the 5,000 later on in chapter 6, Jesus asks Philip, he says to him, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? Philip kicks into gear. He's like, okay, there's 5,000 people plus thousands of women, thousands of children. Um, It equals a lot of hungry people times the cost of bread times one by each equals eight months' wages. You know, that's what he says. You know, in this situation, he's doing the maths. He's like, okay, how are we going to do this eight months away? If you're an accountant, Philip's your man. Do you know what I mean? If somebody's into the detail, if you've worked for the treasury, Rosie Phillips, Phillips, you see, Philip is your man. (laughs) And the interesting thing about Philip is whereas God often speaks to people 
that other people, um, to people through other people. Philip was the exception. Jesus went directly to him. He spoke directly to him. Fifthly, there's Nathaniel, a man of integrity, he's described as. He's like no-nonsense kind of guy. You know, he's sort of like, um, you know, cut the fluff, get straight to the point, totally authentic. Jesus said of him, if you look in verse 47, it says, he is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Nathaniel was searching, he was questioning. We can see in verse 46, just that verse before, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? He's asking that question. What's, what, what good can come out of Nazareth? And Nazareth had, um, had a reputation for being a bit backward, you know, out in the sticks, uh, irrelevant, significantly insignificant, if you like. Some say that it was even possibly quite a sinful place, quite a depraved place. And the inference that whether either morally or strategically, the word good and Nazareth, just di it didn't go hand in hand. And Nathaniel was processing Philip's claims of this encounter with Jesus. And then sickly, there's the other disciple. And his name isn't even mentioned, so I'm not going to mention him either. That's that. That's the six. That's the six characters that you look at. Six very different people, very different characters, different backgrounds, different stories, different successes, different failures, all encountering Jesus in very different ways. And I don't know, maybe you resonate with one of them or a characteristic of one of them or sort of just think, oh, yeah, that's just me. You know, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, gosh, I do see myself in that one. The point is... There's not one type of person that follows Jesus. And the point is, there's not one type of person that goes and does something like Alpha. You know, don't be fooled in thinking, gosh, no, my neighbor's just not the sort of person to invite to Alpha. You know, or my dad's not the sort of person who would do Alpha. My football team, they're not the sort of people that would do Alpha. Everyone is welcome. Everyone's story is different. And Jesus invites you to come as you are. Secondly, Jesus invites you to come and see who he is. You know, the first thing we see about Jesus in this passage is that, is that he sees us. I... Um, I heard, this, I heard this story once of, um, of a burglar. And uh, he broke into a house and uh, he wanted to steal things, as burglars do. And so he was looking around and he found a laptop and he picked it up, went to put it in his bag. And then he heard this voice and it was, Jesus is watching you. And uh, freaked out, paused for a bit, looked around, couldn't see anything or anyone. And then he carried on again. He found an iPhone, found a bit of jewelry, picked it up, went to go and put it in a bag, and he heard again, Jesus is watching you. Totally freaked out. He gets his phone, he shines his light around, looking to see who it is, and he sees this parrot in the corner, and, uh, and he says, was that you? And the parrot says, yes. And he's like, who do you think you are? And the parrot says, I'm Moses. And the burglar says to the parrot, what kind of people call a parrot Moses? And the, and the parrot says, the kind of people that call a Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is watching you. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, I love that joke. I must admit, I love it. Big fan of that. <laughs> but um, the point is, it's not in a Jesus is watching you kind of freaky way, kind of he's out to get you sort of way. But Jesus sees you. Nathaniel, in, in, in verse 48, Nathaniel asks, how do you know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, some scholars think that Nathaniel was under the fig tree, searching the scriptures, wondering, you know, what makes a true Israelite? Jesus sees him. He knew him. He knew what he was thinking. And Jesus could have said, I saw you, and to be honest, you were being a little bit out of water, a bit cynical, and you were slagging off my hometown. But he doesn't say that. He sees him with eyes of love, and he says, he says he was a true Israelite. You know, that was a huge compliment, in whom there is nothing false. 
You know, a man of integrity, a man of authenticity. He saw the good in Nathaniel, straight talking, searching, genuine questions. You know, God doesn't just notice you. He knows you. Jesus, he sees us, he sees our imperfections, but he also sees our potential. Looking at the verse 42, when talking to Simon Peter, it says, he looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You know, he knew this larger than life man with his flaws, and he told him, you will be called Cephas, Peter, rock. And his ministry would become the foundation of the worldwide church. You know, when Jesus sees us, he sees us not just as we are, but who we can become. And I love this book of God. You know, the book of John, is, it's all about vision. It's all about seeing Jesus for who he is. Nathaniel's revelation and declaration right at the very end of that passage, verse 49, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Come as you are. Come and see who he is. And thirdly, invite others to come and see. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, said, this country will not know the revolutionary love of Christ by church structures or clergy, but by the witness of every single Christian. And a witness, a witness simply says what they have seen, what they've experienced. John the Baptist said in verse 34, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. You know, when we see Jesus, when we experience his love, we can't help but go and tell others. In verse 41, the first thing Andrew did when he encountered Jesus was to find his brother Simon and tell him, it says, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, I often think families, actually, they're they're probably the hardest people. I don't know if you feel like this, the hardest people to to talk to Jesus about, just because they, they know everything about you. Don't you? They know when you're, you've made a mistake, when you've messed up warts and all, they, they know you. And, and um, I didn't grow up in a, in a family that went to church. I became a Christian when I was 15. And when I encountered Jesus, I had this experience, experience of his incredible love through his Holy Spirit. And I remember just saying, I just feel known. I just feel seen and I feel known by God. And I was, you know, totally blown away. Like, this Jesus, he's real. This isn't a fictional story in the book. This guy is alive. He is here today and he knows me. And I think once I just had that revelation, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to tell everyone. I wanted to tell my family. I remember my dad coming up and cleaning my bedroom window and um, just you know, washing the outside. And I thought, this is my moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my stereo on really loud and I'm going to put on my gospel music. And I have one of those really old-fashioned like, ones where the lights go up and down, you know, the graphic equalizers. Anyone still got one of those? <laughs> just me. So, um, yeah, so I just thought, I'm going to see those lights dance up and down, baby. And then I'm going to see my dad experience the Holy Spirit, the love of God It's going to fall on him, he's going to be on his knees, he's going to repent, and he's going to just go, yeah, I've got a new life in Jesus, so that's what's going to happen. He didn't, he just did a really good job of washing my windows. But, um, you know, it's that enthusiasm to want to see, well, you know, I'm desperate, if this music's going to like somehow just, he's going to encounter him through the, through the music. My younger brother was five years old at the time when I became a Christian, and, um, you know, Again, just desperate for him to know something of God. A little bit intense, I know, but I would play this game with him. It's like a little guidance game. I'd ask him to close his eyes, and I'd take him by the hands, and I'd lead him around the house, and, um, and I would quote Bible verses at him. So I would basically just say, you know, from Proverbs, I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. You know, I mean, poor kid's five years old. But, but it came from a good heart. It came from a place of like, I just want my family to know God. And that there were definitely times I just thought, okay, I'm being, I'm being a bit intense. I'm being a bit insensitive. I'm being a bit over the top. And, and you don't want to be like that. But equally, you don't want to make the other mistake that I made, which is sometimes just to pull back and not say anything. Like never talk about Jesus, never talk about faith, never, never talk about how, how he's changed my life. And it's not really good to make that swing either. And then my brother moved to London a few years ago, and, um, and I invited him to do Alpha. And I just um, said, you know, would you like to come and do Alpha? Explained what it was. And he said, no. 
And I thought, okay, so then the next term, it came around again. I said, Alpha's starting up again. Would you like to come and do Alpha? And he said, uh, no. I just thought, oh, okay. And then it came around again. And um, he said, no. <laughs> and it actually got to a point, I'd asked him seven times, and I thought, I've got to somehow change something here. So what I said was, rather than asking him, would you like to come and do Alpha? I said, how do you feel about the fact that I keep asking you to do Alpha, whether you want to come? And it really interested me, because he said, well, the thing is, because you keep asking me, it makes me think that this is something that's really important to you, and that you think is really important for me. So I'll come. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> Amazing, fantastic. And he came, and um, he didn't actually do the whole course at the time. Um, he was moving house and changing jobs and all sorts of things. He enjoyed, he enjoyed what he came to, and he since came to other events at church. And um, he's on a journey, as we all are. When Philip met Jesus, he went and found Nathanael in verse 45 and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And when Nathanael questioned, can anything good come from Nazareth, Philip, you know, the practical disciple, remembered. Remember, he gave a practical answer. He said, come and see. Come and see. It was a personal invitation. Another friend of mine, I'd been asking, I asked her whether she wanted to come to Alpha, and she, she said yes. She came, she did the whole course, and she gave her life to Jesus. She encountered Jesus, she became a Christian. Six months later, she got confirmed. True Anglican as well. And then she invited her housemate, and her housemate came and did Alpha. Her housemate, she just sort of basically said, come and see. That's the invitation, come and see. God's work doesn't begin with us. It begins with him. It's a personal invitation, and it's also personal intercession. That's why as a church, we're encouraging one another to set your alarm for 11.02. Luke 11, verse 2, your kingdom come. We're praying over these days, your kingdom come in the lives of people. We want, to know, you know, want them to know Jesus. That's why we want you to come to kingdom come on, on Tuesday night. Come and join us as we pray, as we intercede. It's personal invitation, and it's personal intercession. And I prayed for my brother and my friend, both those, both those two, for years. I fasted every Monday, actually, during term time, praying for an opportunity that they might even just say yes to, to coming to Alpha. And, and I have to say, you know, it's that thing of, oh, well, when you pray, things happen. And I just thought, is it, it, it's interesting that after a year of fasting every Monday, it was that time, that seventh time, when my brother said, yeah, I'll, I'll come to Alpha. I just wonder if there's something in that. So we intercede and we invite. We you know, invite our neighbors, invite our colleagues, invite our family and friends to come and see Jesus, who he is, who sees us, who knows us, who loves us. And what strikes me in this passage is that each paragraph begins with the next day. If you look, if you're looking through, the next day, and I think for me, this really speaks as a reminder to not put off these conversations, to not put off these invitations. There's a sense of urgency around it. And when the first disciples saw Jesus, they had a decision to make, whether to believe and to trust in him, whether to follow him. You know, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And maybe you're here today, maybe you've been dragged to church today by someone, and you're thinking, I don't even want to be here, I don't really know what's going on, what's she going on about, um, I'm not really sure what I've come to. But, you know, I just want to say that you can begin a relationship with Jesus today. He, he knows you, he loves you, he sees you. And the invitation is, you know, come as you are, Come as you are. Come and see him for who he is.